Hi everybody, so every so often I sort of rediscover one of the tunes I learned when I was first learning jazz and I realise there's a lot more to it than I thought. And Footprints is a very good example of that. Um, there's a number of reasons why one might learn a tune wrong. The first thing is you're just not really as good a musician, so you might make mistakes if you're learning it by ear. Um, the second thing is you, if you're a musician of my sort of vintage, you might learn it from the old real book, which was full of mistakes. We'll come to that in a second. Or there's a lies to children aspect, to use the phrase popularised by Terry Pratchett, which means, you know, uh, like, you're kind of simplifying things a little bit to help the ideas become more accessible, as a common thing in education, in science education in particular. So, for instance, uh, like the way we might say, oh, the atom is like a little solar system. It's actually nothing like that at all. But as a model, it kind of works, you know, when you're first understanding things about how the world works. So you use a sort of outdated or simplified model. And um, in the case of footprints, you might find this simplified chart, which I'm just about to put up, uh, comes into play. And this is the original um, illegal real book chart. It's um, transcribed by Berkeley College of Music students in the mid 70s. Um, the book has famously got lots of mistakes in, but you'll still find a certain generation of players who passionately defend it, probably because that's um, how they learn all their tunes. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, I think it was just a lot better than what came before. So people tend to, uh, I think people have a strong emotional attachment to this. Um, in practice, I think these charts are really out of date. We've got much better sources now and they should be avoided. Um, but let's have a look at what we've got here. So I, th I think this chart is reasonably useful in that it does show you um, how Footprints is a reharmonized 12 bar blues. Um, if I take an example of a simple 12 bar blues, something like Equinox by um, John Coltrane, and it's boom, ba, ba, boom, ba, ba, da, ba, ba, F minor seven, I'm just playing simple shapes here. Boom, ba, ba. Gets A7. Ba, 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 da, ba, boom, ba, ba. Right, something like that. You know, Thrill is Gone by BB King, any of those sorts of tunes. Um, it's a one, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, three, four bars, and then four for two bars, one for two bars, and then flat six chord, usually seven, flat six, seven, five, seven, one. And flat six, seven has that bluesy. So where the uh, flat five uh, usually comes in in the melody because uh, that belongs to that chord. It's the seventh, right? So yeah, da, da, za, yeah. and you can play the the blues scale a little bit there in the um, in the top voice. So that's probably where that comes from. I don't know, just a just a theory. Right, if we look at this chart for footprints, you can see like the turnaround at the end is quite simply just a reharmonized version of that. And they've just done a tritone substitution. So it's a instead of A flat, we've got D7. Instead of um, G7, we've got D flat seven. These are tritone substitutes, right? And it fits the melody. And then Works. Um, it's not what Wayne wrote. <laughs> we'll come to that in a second. Okay, so footprints, um, the melody. Okay, so I think this is the way most people play the melody because they probably read it in the real book. Song, right? This is um, not how Wayne plays it, and it's also interestingly not how he wrote it because we can actually have access to his um, autograph um, lead sheet, which he submitted to the Library of Congress for copyright reasons. And um, he actually writes it out a lot more like this other chart, which I'm not going to show you because I'll probably get a copyright strike, but that's um, from the New Real Book. And this is not exactly the same as Wayne Shorter's chart, but it's close enough for our purposes, so we're going to use this. Um, the new real book on the whole is a much better source. Um, I think in this particular case, Sher Music Company probably had um, direct access to Wayne Shorter's original lead sheet. They often based the chart on the composer's lead sheet where that was available. 
Um, so the charts for contemporary and modern jazz compositions are on the whole pretty pretty good, which is why a new real book is probably a good shout. Um, they've done some editing things, which make it look a bit different from Wayne's chart, but on the whole, the melody is the same, I think, and um, the changes aren't too different, okay? So I think we can safely use this. Um, this chart is, um, uh, you know, both charts kind of give the baseline reasonably well. And uh, you'll notice that the baseline does not move off C. It kind of stays on C for the F minor 11th chord. And that's something it has in common, uh, stay on the one chord, even though the chord moves, it's something it has in common with all blues, which is another blues waltz. Maybe Wayne had that in mind when he wrote it. Uh, the bass line goes boom, boom, boom. G7 again, so it kind of uh, it kind of doesn't shift off the one chord, even though blues would normally go to chord four, chord four even. Um, so the biggest harmonic difference is this turnaround, which is written as F sharp, basically F sharp half diminished, F7 sharp eleventh, E7 alt, A7 alt, and then which then resolves to C minor. Now it's very weird because yeah, yeah, you're so boom, boom. You'd normally expect that to resolve to a D minor. It's kind of a a turnaroundy sort of thing, kind of like a variation on a I suppose a three six two five one turnaround, but instead it goes to C minor, the A seven to C minor. It's unexpected motion. It's not dissimilar to the sort of thing that Radiohead do actually, and I might have to do a video on Radiohead's harmony. Um, certainly a relatively conventional movement, but then confounding your expectations by resolving to a different chord. Interesting. So um, this makes it a little bit harder to play through because you can't just do the normal minor blues thing. Well, you probably can. You can probably play the blues scale over the whole thing, but you're not. I don't think doing the tune justice if you do that all the time. Although, you know, a chorus or two, that might be fun. So, um, now, a big change in melodic phrasing is this grouping of five. This is in Wayne's chart. It's not just a transcription of Wayne's sort of like uh, free rhythm. Um, this is something that he made a feature of in the autograph lead sheet. So, it might be worth having a look at that. So, um, if I use... Um, sort of multiple syllables to to um, vocalize a grouping in music so for instance you know if I do three it'd be like hamburger 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 then a good one for five would be hippopotamus 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 hamburger hippopotamus 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 hamburger of course, nerds will probably use conical, and I am a nerd, so I will do that. We have Takida for three and Tadiginaton for five. Takida Tadiginaton, Takida Tadiginaton, Takida Tadiginaton, Takida Tadiginaton, ta. So I'm looking for two things, um, maybe imperfectly executed there, but I'm looking to lock my taz in with the beat, with the click, and I'm looking to even out the um, subdivisions that I'm using. So um, the Tadiginaton works like this in the first part of the melody. So Takita, so that last note, the C, is on the uh, one, two, de. It's on the last. Uh, by the way, this chart's written out in 6 4, which is another difference from the original. So one, two, three, two, two, D. It's on the last the last um, notes, the last, uh, in this case, quarter note of the bar. So, but I would still vocalize the whole takida because that keeps you in time. So, um, good, not too bad. Okay, and then later on we got Okay, so once you start to do it, it starts to feel more natural. It's not, it's not, you know, Black Page by Zappa or anything. It's not too horrendous. This is a nice little phrasing touch. So it's so again, ba bo da bo da boom. There you go. Something to spruce up your interpretation of the tune right away. Let me see if I can do that. That's not 
too bad. So that, that gives a different feeling to the phrase. Okay, right, let's move on. Um, I want to talk about how the solo one is progression. So um, I don't necessarily think harmonic analysis is that useful with, with Wayne because um, his chords don't always move the way they ought to if they were, um, uh, you know, functional progression. So I find it more interesting to look at the counterpoint, the way the harmony and the bass, sorry, the way the bass and the melody kind of work together and then go from there. Um, let's talk about the harmony first and I might talk a little bit about some rhythmic devices that we can use. Um, so interesting in the bass line we've got the most obvious way of harmonizing. It's actually a C minor chord grip on the guitar, arpeggiated. Um, you can't go much more, none more C minor than that really. And then over the top we have a melody that doesn't reference the minor third at all. It just goes because this is the third out and plays the ninth and the uh, the seventh and the fourth, right? Interesting notes over the minor. And um, the way I interpret this is I think it's drawn from the G minor pentatonic scale with an extra note with the um, this note A added into it. That was actually me saying the note A, not just saying A, A, A. And this is a common technique for Wayne Shorter to transplant the, the pentatonic into an interesting harmonic environment. So we're playing G minor pentatonic over C minor. Not that weird. I mean, Wes Montgomery did that quite a lot. So um, it's certainly a technique you come across. And uh, the, the other way of looking at it is you could look at it in the relative major, which is B flat major pentatonic. Same notes, different different interpretation. And what that does is it creates the upper extension of a C minor 11th chord, which is indeed what we've got written in the chart. So if you want to get that full rich C minor 11 sound, which is referenced by the melody, then you play, I would say out of G minor and B flat, you know, you can play maybe a B flat major seventh if you're feeling particularly keen, which gives you a very West Montgomery sound in that context. You hear West using those kind of sounds on, for instance, four and six, right? So um, then for the F minor, uh, you notice that the melody kind of moves a little bit to the C minor. Sorry. So I'm playing the real book rhythm again. Um, so that that is kind of C minor-ish. C minor pentonic with an added ninth again. This time it's a D. So I'd probably play C minor ideas or E flat major ideas over the F minor chord, right? Okay. So um, that's all great. Um, let's let's just play that just that much so you get a, an idea of how that works. Here we go. Okay, C minor. Back to G minor, right? I think it sounds pretty Wayne Shortery if you ask me. Okay, so um, that's fine. But how do, what do we do about the hard bit? And for this, I would suggest having a look at the melody. The melody is really suggesting a G major pentatonic over those two chords, right? And then it goes to the B flat over the E, flat five. And then we get this peeling blues lick. You think of it as being a blues thing, because it is, it's C minor blues. Or you can think of that as being like a some hip hop upper extension of A7. It has both things in it. Um, let's start with the F sharp half diminished. So if we put a G major, we get an interesting sound on top of that. Kind of extended Locrian sound or whatever you want to call it. I'm just going to play G major. Triad, and then that also works beautifully over the, the F. We get this sharp 11th Lydian type sound which works well with a 30, F13 sharp 11th and then I like to use a tritone substitute there over the E7 B flat major again just the triad over A7 now this is a nice one the 
suggests an F major triad to me. It's upper structure. Now we can run these chords together, so for instance I can play... And that's running F sharp, uh, mostly F sharp, half diminished into G, G major. That sounds nice. Um, F major into G, classic triad pair. So... Um, and then uh, the E major into B flat. Oh, was it Stravinsky? We started using that. Um, sorry, I might set up slightly at the end there, but B flat over E, it's that, that sound. And then my favourite actually, which is the F major over A. these film soundtracks in, in those in those chords now actually in practice we don't have time to do that so I'm just going to base my lines on G major for, two, for a bar because that works over both the F sharp half diminished and also the F 13 sharp 11th and then B flat for half a bar and then F over the A7 okay let's give that a go um, I'll try not to muck it up too much G minor pentatonic C minor. That's G minor. Here we go, G major. B flat. F. Nice, huh? I think that worked pretty well. And the nice thing about it is it sort of references the melody. Right. If we wanted to go up to the next level with harmony, we could start adding some notes to those triads, perhaps, especially in that first G major triad that lasts for a whole bar, we might want to have a few other notes there. And um, one note you could add is the fourth. That works for both chords. You know, um, then you've got like the, um, uh, you can add the flat six on the second half of the bar, which is a very, very hip sound over the F7. Which is a, a nice way of building up to, you know, I mean, technically that's kind of moving towards melodic minor harmony, but um, I just like to start simple. Um, and then this one, the B flat. The Simpsons are up with a, with a sharp four. And then the A7, we'll just uh, add in a second. Okay, let's hear, hear how that sounds. Okay, no, actually, sorry, before I get, do that, I was going to talk about the earlier chord. So the C minor 11th, I'm going to use a B flat with another. And add a fourth over this chord. E major with, E flat major with another fourth. And then. Of course, make voicings out of this. Um, people who've been following Jordan Clemens' ideas um, will be familiar with some of those sounds. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, and then we're all good. So I'll try again. I'll try and call my attacks, as it were, so you can hear what I'm doing. Okay, um, here we go. B flat add four. E flat add four. Sounds beautiful, I think. B flat again. G add four. Flat six. B flat. say about the harmony well probably not all but that'll do for now um, in terms of rhythm 
If you find yourself getting locked into this one, two, three, two, two, three, da boom, 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 ba kind of deal, one thing you can do, which is really nice, is you can turn it into a four. So just as if we're in four, we go one, two, and three, four. I can do a six, eight, or a quarter note triplet over the top. Ba, da, 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 da. We can also do the other thing. So one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three. So I'm just singing the bembe bell pattern over the top and you can have that in four or you can have it in six. So it turns out three and four or six and four are basically the same thing in jazz, which kind of harks back to the West African heritage of this music rhythmically. Isn't that cool? Okay, so um, because of that, we can kind of turn it into a, into a four and play like a nice sort of leisurely kind of sleazy swing four. quite badly is you can loop a um, you can put a grouping of five on there and reference the melody anyway I'm just about to run out of drive space so I better ring off um thanks very much for watching hope you found that useful and interesting happy playing